there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Con men, the most enigmatic of the criminal fraternity, these expert liars and consummate manipulators use their intoxicating charm to prey upon the most prized human trait, trust, in order to make money and ravage lives. Join us as we explore the lives and minds of some of the world's most notorious con men and women, exposing their shocking crimes, their twisted psychology, and how their cruel lies led to their eventual downfall. In this show, the con man who bided his time and patiently used love as his weapon to con a woman called Christine Handy out of half a million pounds. The relationship felt really real. Not for one minute did I think there was anything wrong with it. He presents himself as a well-educated, aristocratic figure, and once people start to buy into that, that's when he then starts to look to get money from them. One part of the con was posing as a member of the Rothschild banking dynasty, and experts such as forensic psychologist Kerry Danes will expose, step by step, how he achieved his heartless goal. This man doesn't appear to have any scruples, any morals. Just how can a perfect stranger infiltrate your life and destroy it financially and emotionally from within. I look back and I just think, did I really do that? Did I really believe and trust him so much? The 23rd of June 2003 was no different to any other Monday morning in Cheltenham for newly single mother of three, Christine Handy. It was Monday morning, I dropped my children off at school and then was heading to work, but I had an hour to kill. So I decided I'd stop and have a cup of coffee. Sat down, read the paper. Um, somebody approached me and asked me if they could join my table. And I said yes, and carried on reading my newspaper. And then when I looked up, realised all the other tables were empty. He'd actually come to talk to me. He said that he'd noticed me on a number of occasions and he thought I looked interesting. Sorry, uh, I'm Alex Harry. And the conversation continued between Christine and the mysterious gentleman. He told me his name was Alexander Darakin. He asked me what I was doing. I said I was on my way to work. I asked him what he was doing. He said he'd come into Cheltenham because he always does his banking on a, on a Monday. I asked him what he did for a living. He told me he was a financial consultant. I just took him at his word. He fitted the profile of a financial consultant. He was very well dressed. You know, he'd got his briefcase. And Alexander de Arrican showed an interest in Christine and her life. I told him, you know, I did go there every Monday, had a cup of coffee on my way to work. It was my son's birthday the next day, so I was in a rush to leave. So I didn't spend a great deal of time chatting to him. Ten minutes, and I left. I didn't think I'd see him again. It was just being polite to somebody. This meeting was very organic, very natural. So you meet this this stranger who shows an interest in you in a coffee shop, you know, that seems innocuous enough, doesn't it? I don't think that most people would think, oh my gosh, this man might be a criminal and warning bells would start ringing. Over her cup of coffee with a stranger, Christine had innocently mentioned her Monday morning routine and he had listened. When I returned on the following Monday, he was sat there waiting for me. So I joined him and we chatted. I talked about my life and the children and the fact that I was going through a divorce. Um, just generally having a conversation, getting to know somebody. So because this is the second meeting, there's a feeling of familiarity. You feel safe and secure. You're in a public place. This is not your lifelong friend, but it's somebody that you feel that you know and you're more likely to get to know them a little bit more. Your guard comes down. Christine enjoyed Alexander de Arrican's company, but she was going through the process of a divorce and romance was the last thing on her mind. I wasn't looking for a relationship at the time. Um, 
I was just finding my feet really of living the life of a single mother and because it's quite time consuming with three children. But the man Christine had met was charming, kind and fascinating. He told me that he was one of those children from the 70s, that um, he was 15 and he was a very intelligent 15 year old and got a place in Oxford. Um, and it is something I'd read about. Um, and he certainly struck me as somebody who was very intelligent, interesting, talked about his career. He'd worked for investment banks in London. He, you know, very accomplished man, really. But the reality was the very accomplished man was actually a very accomplished con man. He's slowly and steadily dripping bits of information to her. So he's building up this mythology in a way that's really quite convincing. So this is very effective grooming. It's very effective manipulation. And so within time, he's going to have her exactly where he wants her. But Christine could not have imagined that the man she had only met twice would go on and utterly destroy her life in the cruelest way possible. It's just somebody walks into your eyes just steals three years of it. In June 2003, recently separated single mother Christine Handy had randomly met a man called Alex in her local coffee shop. She could never have imagined that she was being groomed by a con man called Mark Hatton, who had already served time in prison for fraud. And after two meetings, the con man was ready to make his next move. On the third meeting, I turned up and he'd actually bought me a coffee. The coffee was sat on the table waiting for me. We sat down and we chatted. And it was at that point he asked me if he could have my phone number, which I said no. He seemed very offended by that. And then he turned around and said, well, I'll give you mine then. And if you want to ring me and we could go out for a drink. And the con man's manipulation worked. I then felt guilty that, I don't know why, um, that, you know, I wasn't trusting him. So I gave him my phone number. And just as I got to work, he was phoning me. And said he really liked meeting me and he'd like to take me out for a drink. And I said, oh, think about it. And the romantic pursuit continued. He rang me a second time and said, um, let's go out for dinner. And I didn't, I didn't feel secure. I don't know why I didn't feel secure. I didn't feel secure about going out for dinner with a man I didn't know in the evening. Um, so I suggested that maybe we went out for lunch or a drink early evening. Christine had no idea she had arranged a date with a con man. On our first date, we went to a little wine bar in Cheltenham. It was in a basement and it was a summer evening. We were sat having a chat and he suddenly produced his passport, which I thought was very odd, and said, oh, I brought this to show you. And the passport revealed Christine's date was a member of the Rothschild family. His name was Dr. Alexander Mark Alphonsus Nathaniel de Rothschild de Arakan Hatton. Quite a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> That's what's on his passport. The reality was the con man's name was Mark Hatton, and no one knows how he was able to obtain a passport with this fictional name. But he wanted Christine to believe that he was Alexander de Rothschild, a member of the illustrious banking dynasty. Little did Christine know, Mark Hatton's story was a tried and tested hook to draw his victims into his con. The, the story he told about his parentage was that he was the illegitimate son of Edmund de Rothschild and a female by the name of Christina Ong, um, and that he'd been adopted as a, a young boy, um, and that was how he came to be brought back to the UK. Hatton's Rothschild story combined glamour and mystery with rejection, heartache and abandonment. He was a very emotional man and, um, you know, he, he, he pretended to be very hurt by his family background and so, and that was quite a good tactic really when you think about it because it stops you asking questions. 
Christine already thinks that Hatton or Alex as she knows him is somebody who's kind, attentive and caring but now he's building on that and he's portraying himself as also really quite exotic and more importantly very emotionally vulnerable. So I'm sure that she felt some sense of affinity with him because she'd just come out of a divorce but by presenting this bogus backstory of himself, he really was making it more and more likely that he would be able to manipulate her and would eventually be able to take her money. Mark Hatton is in no way related to the Rothschild family. And despite the grand gesture with the passport, the Rothschild story was not the reason Christine was attracted to her date. Oh, he's very charming and he was very kind and he was very humble. Um, sorry, I'm smiling. I just find it hard to match the two together now. Um, but he, yeah, he, he, I, I think that was the thing that I liked about him. He, he just seemed enormously kind. He practices what's known as sweetheart scams. And the sweetheart scam is any scam which revolves around making someone fall for you. And in a way, they're the cruelest scam because you end up... Um, you know, not only with an empty bank account, but with a broken heart as well. And Christine was hooked in by the con man. After their first date, many more followed. I saw him a lot. Um, he phoned a lot. And that was a big part in our relationship, phone calls. I mean, he could ring 20 times a day. And they also spent more and more time together. So he, he'd come, we'd you know, spend the day together. Children were in school, we'd spend the day together. Go, you know, go out for lunch or... Um, and then you, you sort of disappear for a couple of days. I've got to go to London. I've got some meetings. I need to get sponsorship for the London Business School. The reality was that Hatton was sowing the seeds of his con, combining romance with his talk of the London Business School. Christine Handy was unwittingly being groomed. A few months into the relationship, you know, we were dating regularly. Um, he'd met my children. We all gone to the cinema together. Um, I met his sister for coffee. Um, he'd met friends of mine. It just seemed like a normal relationship. The con man played the role of the perfect partner who had fallen head over heels for Christine. He was very full on. You know, he'd never met a woman like me and um, he loved me. He wanted me to be his wife. And I'm just thinking, well, this is going a bit fast. He was saying how much he wanted to get married and have a family of his own. And um, he never actually asked me, he never said, will you marry me? He just talked that we would get married. The con man had convinced Christine he loved her. Hatton was also pretending he had a place at the prestigious London Business School to do an MBA. But he was struggling to secure funding for the course. For quite a few months, I'd been watching him going off to London, trying to get sponsorship for his London Business School. And um, he'd return back and he'd be deflated. He couldn't raise the money. And it just went on and on and on. And I think that started in the September. So by the time we got to November, um, he just seemed completely flattened. And he was hoping to start the course in the January. He was running out of time. Hand in hand with the fictional woes with the London Business School came another lie a lie that implied once Alexander de Rothschild completed his MBA, the couple's future together would be bright. The story was that he'd been headhunted. This bank in Switzerland had offered him a job. He was sort of holding them back. He wasn't quite sure he wanted to go back into banking. Um, the months rolled on. He took a few trips to Geneva, telling me he'd gone for interviews and to meet the board of directors, and they were very keen for him to join them. The job of a lifetime in Switzerland was dependent on the MBA at the London Business School. But the Rothschild rogue was claiming he could not secure funding to cover the fees. Mark Hatton had created a complex web of lies and slowly but steadily had ensnared Christine. I think in the October I started to think, yeah, I really love this guy. I mean, he's just do anything for me and he's so nice to me. and. Kids seemed to like him when they did see him. Um, he started then going on about how he wanted a family of his own. And um, I said I didn't want any more children. I was 38 at the time. I then started getting the, the tears of how 
he's obviously the illegitimate son of Edmund de Rothschild, so he's adopted, he doesn't have a real family. Um, he wanted a family of his own, and you know, the greatest gift I could give him was a child. The reality was there was another gift the con man wanted more than a child. It was then also the time that he said about the, I really need to get into the London Business School, can you help me? And he seemed to be really getting down about it, to the point that he would actually sit and just cry and say, it's so difficult. You know, as soon as they realise that I'm a de Rothschild, they just assume I've got the money to do the course. I said, well, I wasn't in a position to help him because my divorce settlement hadn't finalised. But he knew it was all going on in the background. The passport, the Rothschild backstory, the job in Switzerland, the stories of the London Business School and the endless I love yous over the past six months had led Christine to this point. This is what Mark Hatton had been working towards. He had put in the groundwork and now he wanted to see a return, a £75,000 return. And I just said, I, I can't help you. And he said, but you could. And I said, I don't have any money. And he said, yeah, but you've got your house. I need the money. Well, I haven't got the money, I've told you that. Is there a way you can get funding for the house? Because we were going to be, at that stage, we were talking about getting married and he'd got this job in Switzerland. So you're going to have to sell your house in maybe a year or two years' time. So that's what I arranged to do. I put a charge on the house and lent him the money for the course. By the time I got the money to him, that was in the December of 2003. Um, everything seemed normal. And come the January, he started at London Business School. He'd have all his books and his suitcases and his computers. He never at any time enrolled on a course or paid for any courses at the London Business School. And on the bank statements, you can clearly see that when that amount of money goes into his account, he then goes on a massive spending spree, buying lavish goods and, and designer clothes. Hatton spent every penny. But there was more money to be mined from Christine and the cruel con man was not prepared to give up his sweetheart scam until he had taken everything. Now, clearly, for Christine Handy, there were no warning signs that actually Hatton was just using her. When we're in love with somebody, what happens is the halo effect. You only see the good in your partner and you just ignore the bad things. But it's interesting that it wasn't just Christine that was taken in by Hatton. Her friends and her family also didn't think there was anything amiss with this gentleman, even though he didn't want to move in to live with her. Mark Hatton never moved in with Christine because he needed quiet to study for his fictional MBA. But he convinced Christine that he would live with her when they started a family together. At the time, I'm thinking, I do love this man and we are going to get married. And, you know, he's only asking for what other people want when they're in a relationship. And I did have three children from my marriage, so I can't deny him the right to be a father if he's, you know, with husband and wife. So I did succumb to his manipulation. In March 2004, Christine discovered she was pregnant with the con man's child. The day I found out, I phoned him, um, thinking he was going to be really excited. I've got something really important to tell you. I'm pregnant. And there was just total silence. Alex, are you there? And I'm filled with dread, because I'm thinking, but this is what he wanted. And, and I, I felt confused, and I said to him, but, you know, isn't this what you wanted? Oh, yeah, 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 I'm just a bit stunned. I'm, I'm excited, yeah. He said, I just wasn't expecting it and, and, and covered his tracks, really, I now realise. And then he said, I'll come and see you, I'll come and see you. And I'm thinking, oh, he is pleased. Oh, good, at long last, he is pleased. It took him two days to come and see me. And I was a bit taken aback. Why, why so long? Oh, I've just been so busy and, you know, I've been thinking about it and trying to digest the fact that, you know, I'm going to be a father and we're going to have a family. We're having a baby. Whether Mark Hatton's wish for a baby with Christine was a bluff that got called will never be known for sure. But now pregnant, Mark Hatton cruelly had Christine in the most vulnerable position imaginable and he would mercilessly take full advantage of that power. It would be two more years of heartless lies and empty promises before Christine's world would come tumbling down and she would learn the shocking and sick truth about the father of her child. 
Single mother of three, Christine Handy, had been in a relationship with Alexander de Rothschild since the summer of 2003. The con man, who was really called Mark Hatton, had already duped her out of £75,000 by convincing her he loved her. In 2004, she believed she had made him the happiest man on earth when she discovered she was pregnant with his child. He was saying he was going to move in and obviously you're busy with the other three children and I'll help out and, you know, don't lift this and let me do that and I'll be here Wednesday and I'll, I'll change the light bulbs for you and Wednesday would come and I'd have to change them myself and I sort of got bigger and bigger and bigger and I'm still humping bin bags out of the kitchen bin and because no one else is around to help me and it did get quite difficult and... It did cause a problem in the relationship because he was saying he'd be there and he'd do things for me and I'd just find myself on my own all the time with three children and, you know, heavily pregnant. Alex, will you speak to me? I need some help. And when problems arose, Mark Hatton was able to deviously manipulate Christine, ensuring he had complete control. He would turn it on me, saying, oh, but I'm doing this for our future. You've got to be more understanding. Don't be so selfish. He used to tell me I was hysterical a lot, to the point that I remember picking up the phone one day and ringing my sister and saying, Di, would you describe me as a hysterical woman? And she said, you're the least hysterical person I know. Um, but it's like a worm in your head being with somebody like him. They feed these little snippets and, you, it, and they say it often enough that you start doubting yourself. Mark Hatton was blinding Christine with manipulative mind games to con her out of thousands of pounds. But the persona of a hard-working family man also concealed the double life he was living. During their relationship, he never actually lived with Mrs Handy. Um, it was established that he was, in fact, living with another woman in Sirencester for the majority of it. He saw Mrs Handy as a meal ticket, if you like, and that he was pursuing her purely for financial gain. The con man promised Christine everything but delivered nothing. In fact, when the time came for Christine to give birth to Hatton's son Marcus, the con man was nowhere to be seen. And when he eventually turned up, Hatton even took the opportunity to make money from an exhausted Christine. I have to say, I, I think back now and I laugh. He turned up with a bunch of flowers he bought at the hospital with the plastic wrapper around it and gave them to me and I thought and he held his sword and he cried and it just seemed normal. I went on, freshened myself up and came back and he was just about to leave. He said, I'm going to go into town. I need to buy some bits and pieces for you and Marcus. And he said, oh, by, by any chance, you haven't got 20 quid, have you? He said, I didn't have any money to pay for those flowers. He said, I've got to pay for them on the way out. <laughs> so not only had I just given birth to his son, I ended up having to pay for my own flowers. When Marcus was born, he did stay at my house for, I think it was two nights, might have been three nights. Um, and again, looking back, he couldn't wait to, he couldn't wait to get out. <laughs> How somebody could live with a person, be intimate with a person, father a baby with a person and create a life that's actually just hinged on their desire to take money from that person. I think that it says, that Hatton is psychopathic because he's clearly got no empathy. He's emotionally colorblind, if you like. He just simply can't feel what he's doing to Christine because if he could, he wouldn't be able to do it. Christine had a baby to care for, along with three other children. The new mum was exhausted and vulnerable. And Mark Hatton began the next stage of his con in June 2005. He turned up at the house, completely panic-stricken. Um, he, he looked like a rabbit in the headlights. He was scared, he was emotional, very tearful. And I'm saying, what's going on? And he said, they've hit me with a tax bill for £80,000. And he just went on and on and he was beside himself. And he said, I really need you to help me. And I said, I can't, I can't raise that sort of money. And he said, well, there's no choice for it then. I'm going to have to leave the country. And I'm thinking, great. Here I am with your son, um, and he's going to take off. I, I couldn't let it happen, you know. It's sort of, I, I felt I had to help him, otherwise I didn't know what was going to happen. And I said I just couldn't raise that sort of money. I could get 50. And he said to me, which was reassuring, 
a little bit of reassurance, he could raise the other 30. Christine had previously loaned Hatton £75,000 back in the December of 2003 to cover the fees for his bogus MBA. Now, July 2005, saw her loan him a further £50,000 for his fictional tax bill. All the money was frittered away on luxuries and in designer shops. Throughout their relationship, Hatton had talked about moving to Switzerland with Christine. He then set about persuading Christine to sell her house, arguing that when he took up his Swiss banking job, they would need to move quickly. So it would be best if she lived in rented accommodation. He started talking about, you know, he was going to sell his house and you should put yours on the market. And that, that filled me full of dread because I've got a newborn baby. And I'm just thinking, could I go through all the process of selling a house and moving somewhere else? And um, But he kept saying it was important. He um, wanted to be able to leave very quickly. If I was in rented accommodation, we could just pack up and go. This is uh, quite an interesting um, tactic on his part because... <laughs> It's a kind of um, emotional hurrah in the sense that the hurrah is where you get someone who's already invested to an extent to invest even more. And at this point, bear in mind, Christine really needs him to be telling the truth. The consequences of him being fake are too horrible to contemplate. So that's how he really plays the hurrah in this instance. It was then in the summer of 2005 that he convinced me it was time to put it on. And because I think we were supposed to be leaving in the January of 2006. So I sold the house, moved into Sirencester, and thinking, well, I, I got there in the August, so I'm thinking, you know, a few months come January, we'll be going off to Switzerland. The move into rented accommodation was temporary as far as Christine was concerned. Once again, Hatton's promises of moving in never materialised. But moving Christine away from the security of Cheltenham not only meant that she had sold her £500,000 home, it also meant that for the first time in their relationship that Christine was truly at his mercy. He helped me choose the house, and the house is very remote. And, of course, when you're living out there, your friends in Cheltenham are going to just pop in for a cup of coffee like they did here. You know, the door was open, the kettle was on. Um, so I suddenly became very isolated. Um, which was ideal for him. And isolated, Mark Hatton set about conning the mother of his child out of more money. Now Christine had sold her house, she was sitting on a substantial lump sum, which Hatton was determined to get his hands on, this time using his financial advisor persona. On the 12th of September, there was £105,000 I wanted him to invest on my behalf with Pictet Bank. Well, his suggestion picked a bank because I'd never heard of them, but he was investing it anyway. But I still had some money left. I mean, I didn't give him everything. And on the 13th of September, I discovered, only recently, that he'd actually gone and bought himself a brand new BMW with the money. Although twisted and inhumane, Mark Hatton had expertly manipulated Christine from their first meeting in 2003. Over two years later, and the villain had taken almost every penny from his prey, with a string of empty promises and the unbelievable extreme of fathering a child simply to make his con believable. He told Christine Handy he'd secured a job with a Swiss bank and that they would be moving out as a family to Switzerland. But he couldn't tell her what bank it was, as it was top secret, until the news had been broken in the Financial Times. And so he again strung her another set of lies about this promise of a, a new life in Switzerland. At this point, Christine is really in an impossible situation. She's invested everything into this man. She's invested everything financially, but also she's very invested emotionally. She has a life with this man. She has a child with this man. She isn't going to want to lose him. She isn't wanting to take that risk. I look back and I just think, did I really do that? Did I really believe and trust him so much? I'd been jumping through these hoops that he'd set out for me, for me to be a family and be with him. And yet nothing was materialising. All the things that he said he was going to do didn't happen. The move date to Switzerland of January 2006 came and went with more excuses and lies. And Christine was left alone and isolated from her friends in Cheltenham. I think I got to my darkest point that I 
just thought, what am I doing? What's going on? And, um, and I really felt that I was losing a grip on my life, reality. And I remember thinking, this has got to stop. And the only way I could bring it back into control was to actually go back to Cheltenham, be around my friends and family close by. And, um, and that's, that's surprising that I'd, ha I'd have the courage to just get up and go and take back control of my life. The relationship was becoming strained. Mark Hatton had taken almost everything from Christine and she was seeing less and less of the con man. But believing the lies he had painstakingly spun over the last three years, Christine still believed their relationship was worth fighting for. I mean, obviously there were days I'd think to myself, what am I doing with him? Um, and then other days I'd see the man that I'd met and think, well, that's why I'm with him and that's why we have a child together. And I was still prepared to you know, work at the relationship. But in June 2006, the con man made a catastrophic error by taking Christine to his brother's home. And Christine hit it off with Hatton's sister-in-law. I said to her, why don't you come and have coffee with me? Well, the next thing I know is Alexander's saying, why have you invited her here for coffee? And I said, well, because I like her. It seems a friendly thing to do. And, you know, she's going to be my sister-in-law one day. I don't trust her. And he really didn't like it. And I said, well, she's coming. And I told him when she was coming, and then the, the day she was due, which is the day he'd normally be in London, about half an hour before she arrived, he turned up. He sat here the whole time. And I, at the time, I just thought, that was a bit odd. Why? Why are you here? I didn't mind him being here, because he's my partner, and but it just, again, was just something odd about it. And he didn't leave until she'd gone. I don't trust her. I had a huge row with him that night because he came round and said, I don't want her here. He, he was saying that they'd always had problems with her. And um, I said, you can't tell me who to choose as my friends. And well, if you loved me and you respect me, you do what I ask. Um, and in the end, he left. And I just thought, I'm going to have to phone her and say, look, there's an issue here. I don't know what's going on in your family, but I didn't want to make things worse. Little did Christine know that when she made that phone call to Hatton's sister-in-law later that week, her world would be utterly destroyed. Hi, I really hate Christine. I rang and told her, which is when then she said to me, are you financially involved with him? Well, well, I hope you've not given him any money. Her words were, if he's a de Rothschild, then my husband's Mickey Mouse. And I'm just thinking, oh, you know, God, it's real panic. Um, and at that stage, he was supposed to have been in Geneva, so I couldn't talk to him about what she said. And I had to sit on this information she'd given me for three days. Mark Hatton's sister-in-law told Christine how he had already defrauded a woman in Italy as well as his own brother. I didn't know who to believe. And um, eventually, he rang me saying he was back from Geneva, so I just put, him to, put it to him, what she'd said. And um, he just went berserk. I told you. She's a liar. How dare you? How can I trust you? You don't do what I tell you. In the end, I didn't know what to believe. You know, it was just... I, I just felt like in this constant state of panic. After that phone call, Christine didn't see the man who told her he was a de Rothschild. He disappeared, and she was left in limbo. Christine desperately needed to know if her partner was in fact a con man and if she was ever going to be paid back the hundreds of thousands of pounds that she had loaned him. After months of frantically trying to contact him, Hatton eventually turned up at Christine's door. The last time I saw Alexander was on the 22nd of November 2006, when he stood on the doorstep and said, I think you should go back to your ex-husband until this all blows over. My ex-husband, why? I think I was just stunned, really. I was just... I didn't know which way was up. Mark Hatton would not admit that he had conned Christine, but he did beg her not to go to the police and promised he would pay the money back in the next six months. The horrific truth was becoming clear. Alex! Alex! To discover after three years that actually you've been living in a fantasy and not a fantasy of your choosing or your making must be absolutely devastating. Christine would have had to have absorbed the fact that not only has she lost financially, but she's also lost one of the most important people in her life. 
I didn't know who to turn to and who to talk to. Um, I was worried about, I had no money left and I couldn't pay my rent. So I was doing things like going to the Citizens Advice Bureau, about how I could maintain living and looking after the children. Um, I took myself over to the police station and spoke to a police officer there, DC Arkell. In December 2006, Christine Handy came to the police station um, to report that she believed she'd been conned out of a substantial amount of money by Mr Hatton, who she knew at that time as Alexander de Rothschild. The difficulty really was um, they were in a relationship and within normal relationships, people give each other gifts and, and lend each other money. Um, so the, the difficulty with this was proving that he had deceived her to get all or part of this money that she'd given him. And that's why we needed sort of documentary evidence to, to be able to prove that what he'd told her was in fact a lie. And I realised then what a slippery little character he was. And I realised that I'd got a lot of work ahead of me to be able to give them a case to work on. And I also had to look at ways of getting my money back, which is, I then decided I would make him bankrupt. Christine was able to have Hatton declared bankrupt in July 2007, which opened up his accounts to close scrutiny. And as soon as the police were able to compare Christine's bank statements with Mark Hatton's, it became clear exactly what he had done with the money. He would just go on what appeared to be a massive spending spree as soon as the money went into his account, mainly in areas such as Bond Street, places like Harrods, Ralph Lauren, or top designer shops, and he would be spending thousands of pounds a day. And that pattern of spending would just continue until all of the money was gone and his account was once again in the red. There was a strong case against Mark Hatton, but the con man had vanished. He was circulated as wanted, and inquiries were made with airlines to see if we could establish if he had left the country. But at the same time, Mrs Handy had set up a website called youbetrayedme.com, which I think she'd set up to warn other women of what happened to her. Christine had been conned in the worst way imaginable, but she was not prepared to play the role of the victim. Rather than admit defeat, Christine Handy fought back. So I had to put my story out there to bring up his profile. So I could get some idea, you know, if anyone saw him, they could notify me to warn other women if he was doing the same thing in London or anywhere else. She wanted to actually get a little bit of control back. She wanted to be able to recuperate a bit of self-esteem, really. And so I imagine that that's why she went to the length that she did in order to fight back. So, with the website up and running, all Christine could do was wait. I got quite a few emails from people saying how sorry they were. And then one day I got three emails, all from the same family in Mount Kisco in New York, saying that he was there and he was doing the same thing. The family had become concerned that the illegitimate Rothschild the wealthy divorcee was living with was not who he said he was. The son became suspicious about him and put his name into a search engine and uh, found Mrs Handy's website and contacted Mrs Handy to tell her that this man was living with his mother in her uh, very expensive home in New York. We informed the police where he was and they said, right, we have to apply for an international arrest warrant and we have to apply for an extradition order, by which time he will have moved on. And that was not an option for Christine. She headed to New York with a friend for moral support, armed with the bankruptcy papers, determined to confront the con man. When we arrived in New York, um, we arranged to meet um, Gil Alba, the private investigator who we'd employed to put him under surveillance. The private detective took Christine to a local gym that Hatton visited most mornings. So we saw him coming out in his shorts and I got out the car then and walked over towards him. I just said to him, remember me? And he looked at me and he said, don't do this, Chrissy." And again, it put me on a back foot and I'm thinking, do what? I haven't done anything. I'm just trying to get you to answer some questions. He walked off and I just shouted, here's the bankruptcy papers, I'll put them on the windscreen for when you come out. Mark Hatton now knew that he had not beaten Christine. And days later, she discovered he had been arrested by the FBI. 
Oh my God, that's brilliant news. But little did Christine know that back in the UK, there was another warrant for Hatton's arrest, and this charge was even more sick and twisted than the living hell he had put her through. That did turn my world upside down. That was really difficult. I felt so much guilt just by association. Sorry. In April 2008, Mark Hatton had been extradited back to the UK from the USA. For three and a half years, he conned Christine Handy that she was his partner. She had his child and loaned and trusted him with hundreds of thousands of pounds. However, the abhorrent way in which Mark Hatton had treated Christine was overshadowed by new allegations. Mr Hatton was charged um, with various offences of rape and sexual assault. Um, due to the seriousness of those offences, the trial for those matters um, took precedence over the fraud trial and therefore they took place. Um, in May 2009, he was found guilty of those offences. The entire time Mark Hatton had been manipulating Christine Handy, he had actually been living with another woman. Monstrously, Mark Hatton had raped and sexually abused the woman's young daughter while she was between the ages of 13 and 17. When the teenager was 15, the con man paid for her to abort his child. At the same time, Christine Handy was pregnant with his son Marcus. Christine now had to face the reality that she had not only invited a con man into her home and heart, she had also invited a paedophile. The day he was found guilty on all the charges of rape and indecent assault, um, that did turn my world upside down. That was really difficult. A, because I'd had him in my home and I have a daughter. I've got Marcus and, you know, how do you protect his son, my son, from that? Um, I felt so much guilt just by association. Sorry. Um, I'd... I'd taken him into my children's school. He used to come with me when I picked the children up. That, it was hard. And that did take me a couple of weeks to sort of get to grips with. And obviously still upsets me. It's not surprising to me that Mark Hatton was committing sexual offences against children at the same time that actually he was conning Christine. Because here's a man who's totally ruthless he gets what he wants, doesn't he, regardless of what it is. He's quite happy to abuse people in an intimate way. So there are lots of parallels between the two offences. Although they're different, actually psychologically they're the same. This is a man taking what he wants without any thought for the person that he's taking from. Hatton was found guilty of rape and sexual assault in May 2009. However, the sentencing was delayed until after the Crown Court trial for the callous and cruel con against Christine. And in February 2010, the trial began, and Hatton was pleading not guilty. I was terrified of the thought of going to Crown Court, but at the same time, I realised that it was my chance to be able to stand up and say what was true. But it was the day that the jury went out to deliberate. I remember sitting outside the court thinking, oh my God, I'd fought so hard to bring him to justice, and if they didn't find him guilty, then all that effort, and that, that, was, that was a difficult moment. On the 16th of March 2010, the verdict came in. I just remember sitting there when the court clerk was asking them, you know, how do you find him guilty on count one? I'm counting them one, two, three, and it was just sort of like, oh, thank God. They'd found him guilty on all seven counts of deception. Mark Hatton had been brought to justice for his Rothschild con and found guilty of seven counts of obtaining money transfers by deception. On the 17th of March 2010, the monster was sentenced for all his crimes. The judge sentenced him 15 years for the rape and three years for the fraud, so he was to serve a total of 18 years. This sentence was bigger than we expected. I was surprised. It's a long time. Um, but he got what he deserved. With Hatton behind bars and the nightmare finally over, Christine Handy had to start piecing her life back together. 
I think the most shocking aspect of this con is the very intrusive nature of it. Not only has this man tricked his way into this woman's home, he's tricked his way into her wallet and he's tricked his way into her heart. It's so difficult to talk about it now because you, how you felt at the time and now realising it's a complete lie. It's just somebody walks into your life and just steals three years of it. Christine estimates the full total that Mark Hatton cruelly took from her was in the region of half a million pounds. Since Hatton was declared bankrupt, Christine has only regained a tiny proportion of that money. But she did obtain one thing from him that she truly values. My son's the, the positive, the only positive thing that's come from it. And I feel obviously very protective of him um, because I think he's been dealt a rough hand at an early age and uh, quite something to have to live with, isn't it, to grow up to know that your parent is such a person. Christine Handy loves her son unconditionally, but his father, Mark Hatton, infiltrated her life violating and abusing it from within. I am a victim of a crime, but I don't have to behave as a victim. I, I'm obviously less trusting, uh, but at the same time, I'm determined it's not gonna make me cynical and bitter.